you guys, if you are one of our kiddos, feel free to slip out to my left and your right to Children's Church. Us, if you have a Bible, will you please open up to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter chapter 6. Um, so we got a new pulpit. I'm pretty excited about it. I will, uh, I'll tell you the story of where it came from in, in just a little bit. Um, see what I'm saying? There's a whole bunch of kids, man. Have fun corralling them. I always joke when I'm with my kids at like Lowe's or Walmart. I'm like, it's like corralling cats. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a little chaotic. Uh, all right, with that being said, I want to start off by asking a, uh, a question. Um, I want you to do some self-examination this morning to start off. And so here's the first thing that I want you to just reflect on. I want you to think about how good is your memory? And so I want you to give yourself a rating, okay? 10 to 1, or 1 to 10, sorry. 10 being your memory's perfect. So that's none of us. Uh, so maybe you're like a 9. But like you literally remember everything. As my wife says, her memory is like a trap. You know, it just keeps things it doesn't want to remember sometimes. Uh, others of you, you say my memory's like a 1. You know, like I got this weird thing of like amnesia. I go to sleep and I forget what I ate for dinner the night before. <laughs> like, like it's okay. So I want you to think for a second. I want you to rate yourself. 10 being perfect, 1 being you're terrible, or where you are in between that, okay? So once you got your number, you got, got your number, hopefully you can do it pretty quick. I want you to tell it to the person that's next to you. Just shout it out to them. It's okay. You can talk to them. Go. Tell the number to the person next to you. All right, so here's the next step. I want you to do something kind of bold. This is only going to be hard for some of us who have bad memories. So if you rated yourself... A six or higher, raise your hand, real high, real high, six or higher. Dang, there's a bunch, y'all. That's not a reflection of, of me. So if you say, okay, but my memory is like a five or down, raise your hand, real high. Some of y'all voting twice, no, I'm saying. So, um, so this is kind of the picture of my marriage. Um, my wife is somewhere way above uh, a seven or eight. <laughs> she has like a great memory. And I have a horrific memory. And it's not so much frustrating for me as it is frustrating for her because I don't remember things sometimes. So I'm always writing things down or I'm saying text that to me or sending me an email so I don't forget. I've got all these things that I do like disciplinary wise to make sure I don't, I don't forget things. And it's very common in our household if we're hanging out with people around the dinner table and I'll tell a story from our past and I'll get about halfway through and Audrey will go, that is not even close to what happened, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then she'll like tell what color shirt I was wearing at the time and then I get, I get jealous of her memory. Uh, so regardless of how bad your memory is or how great your memory is, this text today has a massive warning for every single one of us. Regardless if you have a photographic memory, if you can remember the color of shirts from memories 15, 20 years ago, there's a unique danger to you and I as people. Because what we're going to look at in this text is God's going to warn the nation of Israel. And he's going to say, you better be careful or you're going to forget. And the warning in this scripture is, particularly when it comes to seeing God move in incredible ways, that you and I as fallen human beings, we're prone to just not remember it. And so what we're going to look at is we're going to see how when it comes to God's power and his grace and his love, we have to seek to remember those things. And if we don't, there are dire consequences of it. So starting off in chapter 6, I'm kind of jumping right in the middle of probably one of the richest chapters in the whole Old Testament. We're going to start off in verse 10, and we're going to read all the way down through 15. So let's read this together. Here's what it says. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve. By his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods and the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you 
and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. So the first thing that you see right there in verse 10 is a reference to the promised land. Now, if you haven't been in church in a while, or maybe you didn't grow up in church, you may not actually know what he's referencing there. So let me kind of explain it in a find a kind of a quick, simple way. So the promised land was this piece of property in the Old Testament uh, that God had intentionally set aside to bless the nation of Israel in order that they would dwell in that land and they would flourish as a nation. And that land was commonly referred to multiple times in the Old Testament as the land that is flowing with milk and honey. So what that means is, is that the soil was so fertile and healthy that you could grow a whole bunch of different types of crops. In addition, the honey meant that there were so many plants and flowers and vegetation that the bees had a lot of work to do in that land. There was always something to pollinate and ne get the nectar in order that they can produce a whole bunch of honey. If I could word it in my simplistic way, the promised land was prime time real estate. It never depreciated in value and it was always going to increase in value. And God had promised them this piece of property all the way back to Abraham. And God's desire was is that he wanted to bless the nation of Israel in order that they would flourish, because when Israel would flourish, God would be glorified. That would make the name of the Lord famous in all of the earth. This is what Deuteronomy 7, 6, the next chapter says. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possessions out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So what that's saying is I've chosen to make a covenant with this group of people, and my desire is, is that when the nations see that I'm good to you, they might realize that the God of Israel is completely different than all other gods on the planet. And when you see the glory and the majesty and the power of Yahweh, that the other nations might submit to him and follow him, that the glory being revealed to Israel would one day spread the glory of God to the ends of the earth. And this promised land had existed and, and promised over multiple generations. And in the text, you can see he goes all the way back to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Now, if you're not familiar with the timeline, okay, so you have Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12, 7. God makes a promise to Abraham and says that one day your offspring is going to inherit this beautiful piece of land, the promised land. And then you have all kinds of things that take place. There's all kinds of family dynamics and Abraham's family and his kids and his grandkids. And at some point, there's this guy named Joseph. Joseph goes to Egypt, but then he dies in Egypt. And when that happens in Egypt, they take the people of God and they make them slaves. And they're slaves for a very, very long time in Egypt. Then the guy named Moses shows up and he says, God's told me to let my people go, to let my, his people go. And God sets them free through all kinds of awesome miracles and other things. And what God is saying in this text is there's multiple generations between Deuteronomy and Genesis 12. And what the Lord is saying is I've promised you this land for many, many, many years. And the coolest thing to me when I think about that is that God was providentially working throughout the history of Israel to get them to where he wanted them to go. And in that time frame, Israel rebelled a whole bunch. So here's a really quick example of that, okay? I've got to be brief, but it's so important to understand. When you get to Numbers chapter uh, 13, so they get set free from the nation, uh, from the nation of Egypt— and before they got see, set free from the nation of Egypt, they're about to go into the promised land. The Red Sea parts, they get to the promised land, okay? They've fought some things, and a lot of stuff has happened. They get to the place that God has promised. They send in 12 spies. 12 spies go into the land. They come back. All 12 say, the land is primetime real estate. Everything that God has said, that's how it is. But there's a problem. It's filled with giants and fortified cities. And 10 of the spies say, we're not going to obey God and go into the land. Two of the spies say we're going to, but the ten spies gossiped and slandered, and they won the day. And the people of God, rather than going into the land that God had promised them, they rebelled and they went the other direction. And here's my point. The pattern of Israel leading up to this time frame is God says, this is what I desire for you, and yet you find commonly that they rebel. And generally speaking, here's what Israel says. My plans, God, are better than your plans, Lord. And so you want us to go in that promised land, but we're scared because there's people in there. So we're going to wander the wilderness. And literally an entire generation of people had to die before they could enter the promised land. And what God is saying to them in Deuteronomy is, he's saying, don't 
forget that I promised this to you. And don't forget that this promise goes back for multiple generations. So there's a really simple application of this, y'all. We need to realize that there are times where God tells us no, or God might tell us to wait, or God might tell us that the timing of that is not right now, not yet. But God's plans in every case is always better than our plans. And we understand, when we understand that God's best for our life, we should not seek to be in control. No, we should seek to release control and to trust a good God that loves us, that has a way of working through history in a supernatural way to be good to us for his glory. So friends, you guys need to realize, I've had times over the last two and a half, three years that I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Or even with this church, this is how it's going to look. And God's like, Daniel, I don't need your plans because my plans are better. And God has repeatedly done that in my heart and my life over and over again. And that's not just a lesson for a church planter. That is a lesson for your heart and my heart. And I think what God is trying to say to them here is he's saying, remember my plan. Remember what I've called you to. And then God takes it another step in this section of the law. He says that I've provided these things for you. You did not provide them for yourself. So he goes through this list of things that are in this promised land. He says that there's established and livable cities, pre-furnished. You know what I'm saying? It's got fully furnished homes that are going to be there. There's wells and sources of water. There's crops that will satisfy your hunger. There's vegetation and all kinds of things that will meet your physical needs. And then the Lord is very clear in his language. He says, and just remember, you did not put any of that there. He says it four times, over and over and over again, I did it, not you. Now the reason is God did these things because he loved Israel. He was in a covenant relationship with them. And out of his love for them, he wanted to provide for them and be good to them and to bless them. But I think there's something that's interesting about that. You've got to ask, why did God tell them and remind them that you didn't do it? That seems to imply that there's a unique temptation in my sinful heart and your sinful heart. In Israel's heart. The idea is that we're prone to rob God of the glory that he deserves. The fact that God is saying, I did it, not you, seems to imply that the nation of Israel are prone to go into that land, live in houses that they did not build, drink water from wells that they did not dig, and eat food from crops that they did not grow, and stand up and pat their chest and say, look at what we've done. Look at how awesome we were. We obeyed. We were faithful. We cleansed the promised land. Us, 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 I'm great. And what God is telling them is, don't you forget for an instant that every good thing in your life is the byproduct of my grace and my mercy and my power and my providence in your life. So I think that there's a subtle thing in the hearts of every sinful person that's on the planet. There's a lie that kind of creeps its way into our hearts that says this. It says, I don't need God because I'm enough. Like, I don't need God's help. I don't need God's providence. I don't need his goodness. I'll dig my own wells. I'll dig, grow my own vineyards. Like, I have the, my power. I can be disciplined enough. I can be strong enough. I can do everything that I need. You have no need for the Lord. And so when people think like that, what Romans 1 says is they actually choose to ultimately worship something in the creation rather than worshiping the creator. And what that produces is some form of like a man-made religion. Because man-made religion at its core says, look at the man or the woman to earn rightness with God. That's what religion teaches. You achieve it. You work for it. And what we notice in this text is God is saying like that land and everything in that land is not there because of you. As a matter of fact, it's there in spite of you. But I'm still going to be good to you. Because the message of the Bible is not some religious thing that says follow these codes and these rules. The message of the Bible is, is that we get salvation, that we get forgiveness of sins by the grace of God. Because when you and I look to ourselves, and tell me if this isn't true if you know some religious people, and forget people that aren't Christians outside, like think of church people sometimes that are really religious. When people are super religious and they look how awesome they are and what they've accomplished, you know what that always creates? self-righteousness, pride, and self-exaltation. They're kind of miserable to be around when people get caught up with that, you know? 
the kind of person you're sitting in a conversation, and they will give you their resume of how awesome they are and what they've accomplished. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's just kind of frustrating sometimes when that happens. But the message of the Bible is not that you have any right or I have any right to be prideful or self-righteous because of what we've accomplished morally or religiously. The message of the Bible is, is that Jesus has saved you. And that he died on a cross and he rose from the dead to offer salvation to people that think they don't need God when they desperately need him and everything. J.D. Greer, one of my favorite pastors, says it like this, the gospel teaches the opposite of religion. It teaches that God offers salvation not to those who earn it as a reward, but to those who are unworthy and receive it as a gift. And what God is telling them here is, he's saying, be reminded that everything that you have that's good and you would celebrate is from me, not you. So the simple way of me saying it is, uh, if you were born on third, I like baseball. Some of you may not know this analogy, but if you were born on third, don't you stand up and pat your chest like you hit a triple. Because you did not. Somebody stuffed you on third. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so we need to be careful about this. And so the simple takeaway of this is, y'all, you and I over the last year, if you've been here for that, or even portions of that, we've witched, we have witnessed God do some incredible things in our midst. So here's some things to celebrate. We've got a really cool slide uh, that I didn't make. Caitlin did <laughs> But here's what it says. Y'all, we've seen five people in our congregation trust Jesus over the last year. We saw 12 different couples, families, and single people choose to join our church and being a member of covenant with us and be a member of our church. We've seen men and women get into the word of God, some of them for the first time in their life on a regular basis. We've watched God... Uh, heal and grow and even in some cases save multiple marriages we've witnessed single people leveraging their singleness for the glory of god and the flourishment of our church we have moms and dads that are sitting down with their children and they're reading the bible to their children and they've never done it before we have more than a, a few of us in this room who may be in uh <clears throat> We have a few of us in this room that have said, I'm done with church. Like, I don't want to have anything to do with church. Church is filled with hypocrites. Church is filled with, like, hyper, self-righteous, arrogant people. I got burnt. I got hurt. And you're like, I'm done with church. And we've seen many of those people who haven't been to church in multiple years come back to the body of Christ. We have people who listen online regularly all the time because they just want to hear the gospel and they want to give a church another chance. Y'all, we have multiple people in our church most of us, if not all of us, they have a position of leadership and they've never been in that position in their entire life. And by the way, if you're, I'm not a businessman. If you're going to start a company and you said, we're going to put people in charge of areas that have never done it before, you'd be like, that's a stupid way to start a company. <laughs> but by God's grace, that's what we've seen. Children's directors and youth directors and music. I mean, they've, they've had experience in some way, shape, or form, but they've never been the person sitting in that seat. And what we've witnessed over the last year is God has grown them and matured them and helped them get where God desires for them to be. And I want to be careful here, because I completely recognize that a lot of those awesome things that we got to experience, that many of you in this room, you've faithfully given, or you've served, you've tried to obey the Lord, like we want to be found faithful, and so we've put forth a lot of effort and energy. We have worked hard. And so I don't want to, like, diminish that or cheapen that or, like, not celebrate how much many of you have worked. But in light of that, man, we just got to say something out loud. All of that stuff that we've seen God do, you did not do and I did not do. The Lord did those things. And God, and God alone is worthy of all that glory and all the honor for the things that we've been able to see over the last year. And as a result of that truth, man, we need to clarify our mission. It should help us clarify our mission. That our mission is not to make much of us. Our mission is not to make, even make much of the name, the Branch Community Church. The mission of our church is to make much of Jesus. That's why we're here. We want people, when they come here and worship, we want them to leave saying, that's a place that I can encounter in Christ. And I can see the Spirit of God moving in unique ways. Like, that's what our desire is, is that we would put Jesus on display for people to see. Not a pastor or some sort of leader or musician or fancy church page. Like, we want people to see 
Jesus. And see, this is important because if you go down to verse 14 of that section we just read, Jesus, God says that it is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve and by his name you shall swear that you shall not go after other gods that goes for the people around you. And then the text it goes on to say because God is a jealous God who will not share his throne with anybody. So the point is, we have no other choice if we say we're followers of Jesus than to put Jesus on the throne. And if we ever try to creep up and push him off of the throne, God's not going to allow that. Because he's the king, we're not. And everything that we say and everything that we do is about putting him on display for all to see. See, we used to, the Bible says God's a jealous God, and some of us don't like that because we normally think of jealousy out of insecurities. That's not the case. God is a jealous God because there is no other God but the Lord our God. And when he says, I am king and I am Lord, he, there's no other competition with him. So anything that we would do to try to undermine that power and that authority is out of touch with reality. He's like this jealous spouse who's married and is like, I will fight to the death for my marriage because I'm faithful to that person. I'll lay my life down for them. It's a healthy, pure, righteous, good kind of jealousy. And what he's jealous is for your heart and for your affections, and he's worthy of it all. And so our desire in this church is to always make much of him. And then he goes on to give us another warning in this law. Because humans are prone to forget, but God doesn't forget. So he shares all of these things over, look what I've done to you. But then he says, but take care, lest you forget. So not only are we prone to steal credit from God, but we're also prone to just forget it, forget his goodness. So the best example of that, if you just go back like just a little bit, just like a generation before this, what you find is in Exodus chapter 14, okay, the nation of Israel has been set free from Egypt. God has performed multiple miracles to get them to that place. By the way, Egypt at this time was like a legitimate power on the whole entire globe. Uh, we were still studying the Egyptians today and how cool they were, like even all the way now in like 2023. And so they were literally chasing the people of God with chariots to kill them because they were wandering away. It's about over a million people, the people of God. They get to this Red Sea, and they're like, we're going to die. It's all over. Everything that God has done, every miracle that we've witnessed, it's all awash because we can't cross the Red Sea. The Red Sea. And God says, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to hold your staff out, Moses, and I'm going to part the Red Sea. And you're not only going to walk across it, but I'm going to make the land dry so you can walk all of your animals. And if they had any kind of wagons or anything like that, they could go down it. And so God does that. They get to the other side. Then God brings the Red Sea back together and wrecks Pharaoh's army and kills them. Two chapters later in Exodus. It's in Exodus 16. Y'all, by the way, that was such a massive miracle that when they get to Jericho and they meet Rahab the spy, who's a prostitute, they go, Rahab goes, I've heard of the God of Israel. You know what she said? I've heard that he has the power to part the Red Sea. That's how powerful that miracle was. Then when you get to chapter 16 in Exodus, the Bible says that they ran out of food, Israel did. And guess what they do? They forgot the goodness of God. And literally, here's what they say. We were better off slaves in Egypt, where we had food to eat, than we are out here in the will of God. Send us back to Egypt, where they whipped us, and we were pieces of property. And God says, uh, well, I'm going to provide for your needs by giving them manna and quail. They forgot. And God knows this about the nation of Israel. And the point is, you and I do not look at Israel in the Bible. And we don't self-righteously go, man, they were really dumb. That's not the response. The point of seeing Israel like this forgetful is to say you and I are like this. We're prone to do the same exact thing. And if you've got a bad memory like me, it's worse for you. You know what I'm saying? I'm just kidding. It's worse for all of us. We're just prone to forget what God does. Listen to this quote from Kevin DeYoung from an article I read. He says, The only thing more difficult than finding the truth is not losing it. He says, What starts out as new and precious becomes plain and old. What begins a thrilling discovery becomes a rote exercise. What provokes one generation to sacrifice and passion becomes in the next generation a cause for rebellion and apathy. Why is it that denominations and church movements almost always drift their theological moorings? Why is it that people who grow up in church 
are often less articulate about their faith than new Christians who converted to 40 at the age of 45? Why is it that those who grew up with creeds and confessions are usually the ones who hate them the most? Let me tell you why it's that way. It's that way because you and I are prone to forget. And so what we need in our lives is we need disciplines and practices to remember the goodness and the grace of God. So I want to read something to you guys. Uh, this is um, Adam Cunningham, the guy that was the first video of the missions pastor. He and I are really good friends. And when I first started this process, uh, he said, Daniel, I think you should start some sort of journal uh, to just remember all that God has done in your midst. And um, the problem was when I began to journal, I did write a lot of great things that God has done over the last year, over the year and a half, really. But I also journaled a lot of things that I was struggling with. And so I was reading through this this week, trying to prepare for what could I share from this journal. And it's like, I can't share that. Like, that's, that's a really deep personal thought that I don't really want to read in front of a whole group of people. And because what happened is God just allowed me to write some of my deepest, darkest struggles. And, um, but through my prayer time, and I let Audrey read some, and she helped me find a good place. So here we go. So let me read to you. So this is from January 9th, 2022 year ago here's what i wrote i said we launched the church last sunday and we got to see god do some amazing things we had over 100 people at the service and a lot of them were from plant city who just came to support us uh, but around 50 or 60 of those people were potential people that would be a part of our congregation we had somewhere between 20 and 30 guests show up at that service and every single thing that we did to try to invite people to church. We passed out coffee, uh, we put something on the radio, we went door to door, and we invited people personally. Every one of those things, there was a guest here because of that. I said, Pastor Brian was here, and he shared his heart, and then here's what I wrote. I wrote that my prayer now is as we follow up with each of these guests, that we might get to see one person come to faith in Jesus and follow in baptism. And God, would you please do that for your glory and for your splendor, would you please do that, Lord? And so I wrote that a year ago. And a few weeks later, I go to get coffee with John. And I sit down with John, y'all, and I'm telling you, like, I'm, I'm not the strongest evangelist in the world. Like, there's people that are soul winners. Like, they go on the street, they, they lead, like, ten people to Jesus. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like I, I, I'm just not a gifted evangelist. But when I sat down with John at that coffee shop that day, I felt like I was talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. Have you never read that in Acts? The, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch is this guy who's like reading the Bible and all he needs is somebody to show up and say, yeah, that thing you're reading is about Jesus and he'll follow Jesus. It was just like they're so close without the truth. And I sat with John and John said these words. He said, I feel like I'm just in this sea of life, just floating and drowning and I don't know how to get out of it. And I'm like, well, I know, let me tell you, his name's Jesus. And that night day, John trusted Christ and it was this beautiful moment that our church got to be a part of you guys see this this pulpit here isn't it cool uh i made it myself no i'm just playing y'all know i didn't make this thing yeah it's a lie some of y'all like i know you know you lying um so john gave this to our church this morning isn't it cool he he built it himself just as an expression of of love and a celebration of what god's done in my life and think about that y'all we have a guy that over a year and a half ago was far from god and now he's building pulpits for pastors and churches the reason I tell that story, and I don't want to be redundant, and I don't want to salt the memories of good people, people who have good memories, because you've heard it before. I say that, it's because we can't forget that. Like, this is what God has done in our midst. And that's just one of probably dozens and dozens of stories of how God has moved over the last year. And my desire, y'all, is that we would never forget what God desires of us. And in everything that we do and everything that we say, we would love God, we would love each other within the body, and we would love people. And of all the stuff we do and anything that we implement, we would never get away from that. So I want to kind of close our time out. James and his team are going to come to lead us out in a couple more songs. Uh, But we just thought that a good way to close this service would be just singing the truth of God. And um, as you're sitting there, before like we get like moving to singing, I just want you to just kind of like reflect on what Deuteronomy 6 is teaching. So what I want you to reflect on is how are you doing remembering the goodness of God in your life? And so here's just a couple things I want to encourage you to do as, as we kind of move into this time of invitation, of 
reflection, maybe where you sit, you need to just stop and celebrate the God's grace in your personal life. Like God's been good to you in some kind of personal way, and you've just moved on. Or maybe you uh, just need to slow down, and you need to remember all that God has done inside of this church. And maybe some of us today, including my own heart, Maybe we just need to repent before God. Um, I think most people here would agree that sometimes we're not openly desiring to forgive. Would you agree with that? Generally speaking, most of us in this room would say, I'm prone to forget because I get distracted from other things. And this is why in Deuteronomy 6, God says, like, don't pursue those false idols. Keep your eyes on me. And most of us may find ourselves, we're just busy. We're just too busy. We work long hours. We come home more tired. And if you've got a family or you've got responsibilities even when you get home, it's just we're prone to forget. And maybe in these moments you're like, hey, I can't even remember the last time I thanked God for his goodness and do it in a specific way. So maybe as James begins to play and sing in just a few minutes, you just want to get on your knees where you are or maybe you want to come down here. I know this isn't like an like a old school church altar. Like you're like, that's a stage, man, you're at Beasley. But if you would come down and just get before the Lord and just say, man, I, I, that's wrong. Like, God, I'm sorry. And just repent before him because he's got grace for you. Um, or maybe you're here and you say, look, Daniel, I am not a Christian. I do not know this Jesus that John talked about. I do not know this Jesus that you are talking about. Well, during this time, I would invite you to trust Jesus today. Uh, I'll be available to you if you have any questions or thoughts. Eddie would be here, but he unfortunately was, was sick and wasn't able to, to make it. But I'll be over here to the side. If you say, hey, I would, I would love to know this Jesus that you guys talk about. Like, I don't want religion. I want Christ and Him crucified. If that's your desire, you can trust Jesus where you sit. Like, you don't need a preacher. You don't need to come forward. Like, you can trust Christ right where you are. Maybe you want to do that. Maybe you're not sure and you just got questions. Well, I'll be available to you. I'll be right over here to the side. I'd love to answer any of your questions or anything like that. But regardless of where you are, my prayer for this time is we would slow down and we would remember the Lord our God. And so as James begins to play, I'll close us out in prayer. We're going to sing a song at the end. It's one of my favorite songs that we sing. And the lyrics are that, God, it is your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. And so we pour out our praise to you. So I don't know what God's doing in your heart right now. But I pray that you would reflect on the Lord. And you would leave this place more grateful for his faithfulness to you than you did when you first came. So let's pray. But God, I need your help with this. I can find myself... Uh, getting distracted with good things and in so doing I miss the best things and I find myself always thinking about the next thing our church should be doing I find myself always wrestling with where the direction we should be going and as a result Lord I, I have these moments where I can forget the truth that you don't need me to grow this church that it is your church your word says that the gates of Hades will never stand against it and your desire is to grow this church, and you have grown this church. And in these moments, Lord, we want to slow down. We want to remember you. And so I pray for the hearts of every person that's in this room. That even as I'm talking, they can't listen because they're thinking of other things. Would you pause all that and focus their hearts on you, Lord? And help us to leave this place with a clear picture your glory and your splendor and your kindness to us. And so I pray for any individual here that is not a Christian. I pray, God, that you would save them the way that you saved John a year ago. Would your spirit move in their heart with clarity and conviction to lead them to a place that they see their great need for a Savior. So God, I pray that you do all these for your glory and your splendor. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.